are the strength when I am weak. You are the treasure that I see. You are my Seeking you as a precious jewel, so Lord, to give up, I'd be a fool. You are my all in all. Jesus, Lamb of God, worthy. Taking my sin, my cross, my shame, rising again, I bless your name. You were my all in all. When I fall down, you pick me up. When I am dry, you fill my cup. You were my all.
I'm going to ask, if you will, please, to open up your Bible to Luke chapter 16. Luke chapter 16. Uh, the passage that we are to read this morning is a passage that is found only in Luke's Gospel. And it is the only passage in Scripture where we hear a lost soul in hell speaking his thoughts and declaring what he feels. And so if we wanted to have a psychological perspective of what it might be like for a man to be in hell, there is no other passage in the Bible that would allow us to receive a man's own thoughts, the words of his own heart, his own testimony and confession. But the, the passage itself, as Luke lays it out, and Luke, is, he does this all the time, it's a study in contrast. He sets before us two men in extreme opposite circumstances. And I mean opposite circumstances, both materially and as we find out as we continue and the story unfolds, they are spiritually worlds apart too. Now, the striking immediate thing we're going to notice is that materially, my goodness, one of them is very, very rich, and the other is very, very poor. They're at as far to the ends of the spectrum on either side is what you can get. And yet as we continue to study this, this parable, this story, and we're going to be actually considering it this week and next week, it's going to come out more increasingly well that they were also a study in contrast spiritually, that the one man, he had a very real faith, he lived in a kind of a conscious sense of need, and that his soul was looking up to God. He existed in a state of daily dependence. No doubt prayers were very real and heartfelt. So that there was a trusting relationship that somehow God would be good. And though his circumstances were evil, the goodness of God would in the end prevail for him. And this was like the only thing he had in life which he could cling to tenaciously in order to get by day by day. The other man, I suppose he might have had what James would refer to as a kind of a dead faith. I mean, he had some kind of a religious upbringing. We're going to hear him refer to Abraham as Father Abraham, you know. But against all expectation, he's going to find that his faith wasn't the right kind. And death changes absolutely everything. For both of these men. And death does that, you know. It's a portal into a, another world. And I'm going to pass through that portal and discuss more of their differing destinies a bit more next week. Because I wanted to reserve an entire sermon for contrasting the differing destinies. What I want to focus on here this morning is I want to talk about the differences of these two men. There is a sense in which I think that these two men do represent all men. And in a kind of a general figurative sense, we can at least link it to this, that, yeah, they're, they're two men, and they're, they're, one of them's going to heaven, and one of them's going to hell. And to be honest with you, that's where all men are going to go. There isn't like a third category where you can say, well, oh, I, I'm not, I don't know that I'm going to heaven, but I'm not going to go to hell either. I'm going to someplace else. And the answer to that question is, no, you're not. Okay? There is a divide and a dichotomy in the which there is one broad way, there is one narrow way, and when that whole stream of humanity hits the pressure point and is forced to the decision and you go and splinter off one way or the other, it's all going to be based upon whether or not you have taken Jesus Christ and what he did for your soul on the cross. That is going to be the sum and substance of the salvation of everyone that goes to heaven. And to not go to heaven is by default to go to the other place. I want to go ahead and read here in verse number 19. I'm going to read the portion that is going to allow us to contrast the two men. This will be verses 
19 down to verse 22. We're going to read down to that far. It says, There was a certain rich man, which was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus, which was laid at his gate full of sores and desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. And moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. And the rich man also died and was buried. Now the most strikingly obvious thing we see about these two men is the utter inequality of their life. Their situations were grossly unfair. I'm, I tell you what, I, I have kids and we all know uh, there's something deep down in the human heart that wants fairness, that wants equality, that just says justice has to be served, right? And this is something that's universally true. If you look at a lot of the political unrest in the world, what is it? It's finger pointing because of unequal situations. And, you know, there are prosperous nations and there are uh, failed nations and there are people that have a lot there are the haves in this world there are the have-nots we have right here a clear case of rich man poor man and it pains us in a sense uh, I left off reading right there at verse number 22 in a sense to kind of like point out that there is a well there's a mystery that surrounds this tranquility and there is this cry in the human heart for justice. Because when I stopped reading right there, no doubt having read all this grossly unfair situation, you, 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 something in our heart just says, no, 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 don't stop reading there. Don't stop reading there. We want the part where justice comes. We want to see what we don't like. The part in this situation here that pains us to even consider it. We want to see some happy ending to the story where it can be resolved and fairness restored. And we do get there. And, and I tell you what, that's gonna, where we're going to be tomorrow but what I, or next week, next Sunday. But what I want to do right now is I just want to consider very carefully these inequalities, these injustices of life by looking at how the Bible describes them. And then we're going to, before our communion, we're going to draw some inferences for how we ought to guide our own lives in view of the example set by these two men. Now, the first thing I wanted to point out, and this is all of this is going to be based strictly on the literal account of the scriptures. The rich man's life is described in terms of what he possessed, what he wore, and what he ate. So if you really, if you're looking for an accounting of what this man was all about in terms of his, what he lived for in life, it all had to do with material things and things that he could selfishly have for himself and enjoy for himself. Look at the verse, verse number 19. Uh, it says, there was a certain rich man which was clothed in purple and fine linen, and he fared sumptuously every day. Now, the very first thing said about the man is he's a rich man. That adjective rich actually comes before the fact that, that he's a man. He's rich. And as for how rich he is, all you have to do is note that in the very next verse, verse 20, he lives in a gated home. You know, gates, you understand, if you see a gate, they're not attached to thin air. They are attached to an enclosure, a walled thing. Sometimes it might surround an entire city. Sometimes, like in communities of the ultra-rich, it might enclose a man's estate. But the purple, uh, purpose of the gate was to admit, well, it was a grand thing, and it secured privacy because, you know, he had a lot of precious things in there that a thief might be tempted to come in to steal. And he had that gate there. 
this part. Not everybody in Israel had lived in a gated estate. The very fact, that, and the word for that gate, by the way, it's a, a pulon, okay? And it had reference to something that was rather stately and rather grand, okay? This would kind of like be walking by the White House or something where, you know, there, you can't really get in unless you go in through a gate. And Lazarus, of course, was laid at this particular gate. And I guess the gate was there so that people like Lazarus couldn't come any closer to the home. So he had that. And, you know, it, it goes in right after announcing the fact that he was rich. It talked about what he wore. He was arrayed in fine linen, right? And uh, it says purple, too. Now, both of those words are kind of suggestive. As we trace that idea of fine linen through the Bible, uh, number one, that's one of the commodities that, we're, that we find sold in, you know, Mystery Babylon the Great, Babylon the Great, Revelation chapter 18, gives that long list of silks and spices and precious things and stuff their soul lusted after, all these things that were being sold as a matter of commerce, right there in the middle of that list is fine linen. That's one of the things given to it. And, and if, if you could have your fine linen dyed in purple, that means that you were very rich. That purple, it was part of a dye that was actually extracted from a certain kind of a shellfish. You would get the shell, shellfish, and you'd only get a very tiny, a most minute quantity out of each little fish. So the extraction to get enough of this purple dye out of enough of these kinds of shellfish, these mollusks, in order to actually dye a garment. It was a very tedious and time-consuming process. And for that reason, that purple dye was extremely expensive. And either you were royalty or ultra-rich in order to have it. So when this guy went out, he was dressed in the finest apparel that you can imagine. He was ready to walk a red carpet, really, with the best of them. And also, we read that he feasted. He feasted sumptuously every day. In other words, his meals were regular. They were high quality. They were rich in variety. And they were ever plentiful. The guy didn't know anything about going hungry. Hunger, thirst, were realities of which he need not concern himself. This guy just ate high off the hog. Now, we contrast that with Lazarus. This man's life was described in terms of what he possessed, what he wore, what he ate. How is Lazarus' life described? Well, his life is described in terms of what he desired. He was living in this world with a heart that was filled with desires not yet met. And it is obviously, as, as the story progressive, progresses, that he had a faith in God that he knew that even if he had not yet received a complete fulfillment of all the desires that his heart did desire, that there would come a point in time when his heavenly Father would meet those desires. But in terms of earthly circumstance, that is what we read. In verses 20 and 21, he lived in a state of continual desire. Look at it, if you will, please. There was a certain beggar named Lazarus, which was laid at his gate full of sores. He desired comfort. He desired the alleviation of pain. He desired to be healthy. And desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. Now, it doesn't say that he desired an equal place at the rich man's table. 
It, it doesn't say that he desired. Uh, you remember when Joseph sent a plate to Benjamin, his younger brother? You know, it is five times greater than all the other. It's not like he was like, oh, I wish I had more and more and more. And no, it says that he desired to be fed with just but the crumbs. In other words, what was driving Lazarus in his desire that he experienced had absolutely nothing to do with greed. It had to do with the pangs of starvation. You understand that? He was so hungry that he desired, even if it were but a crumb. Now, this is important to remember because next week, we're going to find when roles are suddenly reversed, there is a rich man that's going to be, for the first time in his life perhaps, experiencing thirst and, and, and desiring if but one drop, one drop of water can be given, only to find that it can't be given. And Lazarus cannot be sent to alleviate his parched thirst. But for right now, it's Lazarus that's laying there, and this man obviously has all the power in the world to help him out. After all, he doesn't desire a lot, but just the crumbs. And uh, this is not the first place, by the way, in the Bible where we read of dogs, you know, desiring the crumbs that fall from their master's head. You remember that? There's a place, it's in um, Matthew, and it says that there was a woman of Cana that was trying to get a healing for a, a blessing of mercy for her daughter that was vexed by an evil spirit. Now, she was a Gentile woman. She was, from, she was a Canaanite. And so she comes to Christ, and Christ says, you know, um, I'm really not, my ministry, it's not to the, the people of Canaan just now, okay? I'm, 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 I, I'm, I'm here to do my Father's will, and His will is, the, I'm, I'm, to be, I'm sent to the house of Israel and, and not yet to the Gentiles, okay? You're kind of like jumping ahead dispensationally. <laughs> Uh, but she just argues him down, and she says, Oh, it's true, Lord, it's true, and I'm not a Jew. But you know, even the dogs get to eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. And, you know, the heart of Christ just melted in an instant. And he says, Okay, <laughs> you know, woman, for that answer, you get the blessing outside of the proper dispensation to get. I'm not going to. You just argued me down with prayer and a faith that is so powerful that in my place, I cannot say no to you. And he gave her the feast of realizing that her daughter was made completely whole. By the way, there are dogs in this story, too. There are dogs in the story of Lazarus. The dogs in this story, they don't receive anything from the rich man either. They're not actually sent there into this story uh, to receive anything, but to give the comfort that the rich man would not give. And so we see the dogs actually, well, they lick those superating sores that are so painful and so inflamed any more abrasive method to try to mollify and comfort and cleanse them would be excruciating. And so, you know, dogs do that for themselves. If a dog gets wounded, they, they, they clean their own wound and they mollify it by licking it. And as a matter of fact, if one dog, if you, there's a pack of them, some dogs have the sympathy to actually do that for another dog. And they lick each other's wounds and it's part of a healing process. It's a part of a process of mollification. And so here God says, you know, I'm giving this man, here's, an, here's, here's a, 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 your neighbor, another son of Abraham. He's made in the image of God. He's laying at your gate. You will not have mercy on him. I'll send the dogs and the dogs, wild dogs will have more mercy upon him than you. And I, I, I can't think of this rich man here without com contrasting him to the parable Another parable, only in Luke. Remember the parable of the Good Samaritan? And that parable, back when we were in Luke chapter 10 and we studied it, we realized that really it was a portrait of Christ himself. And what do we find there? That that Good Samaritan went totally out of his way, right? He exposed himself to gross danger. He went out of his way to help a man that in life probably would have had an instilled prejudice against him and wouldn't have 
given him the time of day because that man was a Jew and he was but a Samaritan, looked down upon by the very man he went to help. And when he gets there, and he didn't have like daily opportunities, like day after day after day. No, the Samaritan received one fleeting instant where in a moment providence called upon him and said, look, Look there. Will you involve yourself in the plight of that wretched man that's laying there with no help for himself? And it took him just that long to conclude that he would go and he would help, not only at his own expense, but then he actually made promise to the, the innkeeper. He said, now, I tell you what, I want this guy to be well. So you take care of him, and, and I'm going to give you my word. When I return... If you have to spend anything out of your resources in order to get this guy well, I'm going to cover it. Now here was a man who is lived in a gated home and feasts sumptuously every day. And he can't give Lazarus who is late at his very gate. I mean, he can't even leave his house unless he step over him. So we see in this thing that there is a, a horrible contrast here. We talked a little bit about this in Sunday School this morning, about faith and works and the relationship between them. And that, you know, you can have a bunch of right doctrine in your mind. Can you not? You can believe things that are true. And yet, if you are an Orthodox Jewish person in that time and you expect to go to heaven... And you have to step over Lazarus, and thank God he's got, I got a gate here. He'd get up even closer to that. What an annoyance. You might even ask, you know, why could, how could this be? How could this be? How? Why? It makes no sense to us. To be honest with you, part of the reason is because there was a belief that was prevalent amongst the Pharisees that, well, prosperity in life was an indication of God's blessing, that when God was delighted with the life of a man, he blessed them materially speaking. And so when they saw a man prosperous, in their mind, they made an ipso facto deduction. They saw, oh, he's prosperous. He must be godly. Look at how God has given all the blessings to him. And when they saw somebody that was not, they made another you know, inference that, well, he must be getting what he deserved. And it wound up being a culture there that in some ways was almost as pitiful as like, you know, if you go to, well, to India right now, right? You go to India and they have the caste system and they believe everything is mediated by karma. And therefore, if there's a rich man, he's rich because he earned it. And if there's a poor man, he's an untouchable. He's there because that's what he's got coming to him. The law of karma makes no mistakes. And that Pharisee would have said as he was walking right past this uh, poor broken man, his brother, he would have said the same basic lie in his mind just on different premises. But he'd say, he's getting what he deserves just like I'm getting what I deserved. Couldn't have been more wrong. Couldn't have been more wrong. Can I point out also that this one of the striking contrasts is that the rich man is nameless. Well, the poor man is given a name. And matter of fact, um, I'm not so entirely sure. Most people do regard this as a parable. I'm not so sure it is a parable. Perhaps it is. It is given in parabolic form. I'm not going to argue with that. And it's clear that he is telling a story but it, let me let me just point something out if this is a parable it is the only parable in the bible where one of the main participants is actually given a name he's given a name now if that is indicative that lazarus is a real person then i'm gonna i'm gonna is it not reasonable that if one of the these two men is real the other one is real now what what, what do we understand from the fact that uh, well, the rich man, he's nameless. And what does that mean to be nameless? He would not have been nameless on earth. He would not have been nameless on earth. He, on earth, he would have had the big name. People wouldn't, might not have known who Lazarus was, but God knew his name. And God recorded it for us to know as well. I put it down this way. Um, 
Name and recognition are closely related. Now, um, I guess that if you were to look at this man as he would have existed amongst his cronies, yeah, his name carried clout. And uh, when they followed him to uh, a party or something, you know, his name was on every tongue. But Lazarus was the only one of the two that actually had a name. And his name, get a hold of this now, what the name Lazarus means is helped of God, or God is my help. You can translate that either way. It means that God is my help. Now, in that sense, a lot of people have said, well, yeah, he's a representative man. Lazarus represents all of those people that look to God for help. And the rich man, he didn't look to God for help, not really. I mean, he helped himself. Boy, he, had, he helped himself. Um, and we find that it goes further because the rich man's death was acknowledged here on earth in a way that, well, it was not quite true of Lazarus. If you look at that final verse that I read there, I want you to notice some things that are said there. The description. Now, here we are at the very end of life. Now, if we consider death as the closing act in a drama of a man's life, then right here at death, that's when the curtain comes down on the visible performance of the play. And so it's kind of profound when we think, how does each man, what happens when they die? Before they are buried and their story is all officially ended, what is their last big splash in the world? And we compare and contrast it to, and we find out that they, well, they died kind of in a very similar fashion to how they had lived. Because it says, it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. And the rich man also died and he was buried. Now Lazarus died first and that was a mercy to Lazarus. And I believe that it was also a line kind of drawn on the rich man. All of a sudden, you know, at that point, when, when Lazarus died and he was gone and taken away, no more, no longer to appear at the rich man's gate, there may have been a sense in which the rich man who lived yet a little longer, we don't know how much longer, he might have said, well, that's good. I finally got rid of that. I don't have to deal with that. I don't have to step over uh, Lazarus down there anymore. But what had actually happened is that an opportunity that God had given him to do good and to enter into a living, vital faith by doing some good to a fa that opportunity had been retracted. And at that point in time, uh, Lazarus no longer needed any good that the rich man had to give him. God, at the very end, gave great good to him. As a matter of fact, if you look at how it happens here, um, as soon as uh, he's, he's, it says he is carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. And there, there is such a tenderness in that expression. He's carried, I no doubt, gently. And there's a security in it. He's carried in their arms. And he's placed into Abraham's bosom. And the whole thing happens with such an accelerity that there is a swiftness of transformation where he is rescued of a sudden from the pitiful conditions of this life and entered into a life that is so much better than what he left behind. You know, and we are urged again and again in the scriptures not to allow the injustices and the inequalities and the sufferings that we may have to suffer of this life to will so dampen our uh, faith in God that we are discouraged by it. Um, Paul writes this, he says, For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, works for us a far more exceeding and eternal 
weight of glory. For Paul to call afflictions light, when I read the account of how he was afflicted, I say, a Paul is calling afflictions light. And he was afflicted above and beyond anything I have ever experienced. That is quite a thing. But he said they're light. And he said, I reckon that the sufferings of this present time, they're not worthy to be compared with the glory which God shall someday reveal to us. And Peter says the same thing as Paul. He says, rejoice. Rejoice if you are allowed to become partakers of Christ's sufferings here and now. Because then when you have your portion with him on the other side, you will likewise partake of a glory that comes to him from him to you by grace. And so, you know, Lazarus, at the end of the story, he gets all the comfort that he possibly can. But let me think about these things. We're getting ready to go to communion here in just a few minutes. I want to go ahead and, and lay just two or three thoughts on our minds here as we think about it. Here's the first thought. Your earthly circumstances will not follow you into the world to come. Your earthly choices will. The earthly estate men hold in this life, that's no certain indicator, right, of what their circumstances will be like in this world. Now, obviously, we know that not all rich men are damned and not all poor men are lost. And that's why I was very careful to say it is not your circumstances materially, whether you are rich or whether you are poor, that are going to follow you into the world to come. But quite to the contrary, what does necessarily follow us is the consequence of our spiritual choices. And if the choices of a poor man like Lazarus be to trust God, how great, how great. And even greater, I suppose, will be the comfort warded him because of the fact of his trusting God as he did. I also pointed out something else here. That people today, they kind of view worldly injustice and inequality as an argument against God, whom they blame for these kinds of things. Very often you will see this, you hear this in society where people will, well, the, the, like I said, all men have a built-in desire to see justice served. And if they look around and they see injustice in the world, some of them get all worked up in their hearts. They want to be social justice warriors, as they call themselves at time, and bring justice back. Now, I understand that, but when you get to the place where you're blaming God or blaming Christianity or laying fault where it does not belong, you're really not part of the solution, even if you might claim to be. Um, there are injustices that need to be done and, and i tell you what is our part if there if there ever really was supposed to be a social justice group of people i really do think it's supposed to be us and it's supposed to be us based on what we are willing to suffer and what we are willing to live for in the eyes of a watching world they did um they surveyed some harvard students this was not long ago they asked them to what well, they were trying to uh, craft a strategy for their future life. And so a questionnaire was delivered them and they were asked right out. They said, what do you hope to achieve after graduation? You name your priorities because in order to craft an intelligent strategy, you have to have clear priorities. So let's put them down. What are the clear priorities that you're going to be striving for in life? And these Harvard students, you know, and Harvard's supposed to be amongst our most intelligent, here were their three top responses. They wanted wealth, they wanted notoriety, and they wanted status. Can I submit to you that the rich man had all three of those? Lazarus didn't have any. There's something about our very culture that teaches us to want the wrong things and to seek the wrong things. Let's say they get the wealth and the status, and the notoriety, so they have the big name, and everybody in the world knows their name. People go to parties, and when their name is dropped, boy, 
every year tilts in. Every everybody wants to hear what is what is it going to be said about them? When a person goes to hell, they're nameless. They are forgotten. And let me uh, point this out too. Although salvation is by faith in Christ and not by works of righteousness, nevertheless, true faith in Christ is expected to bear fruits of righteousness. And it will be examined on judgment day as to whether or not we, in our faith, showed good works. Works of mercy, works of charity, works of whatever kind come our way to show. Now, we talked a great deal about this. It's amazing. When we were sitting here having these conversations in Sunday school, I'm thinking to myself, golly, how this dovetails with what I need to talk about this morning. But when we stand before the judgment seat of Christ, one of the things that we are going to be considered there, the chief thing is our works. Because he says again and again, I know your works. I know your works. My reward is with me to give to every one of my children according as his work shall be. So in the meantime, when we're living down here, we are to be careful to maintain good works. And now we're getting ready to have communion. And what is, and communion, that's a time of self-examination, right? Communion is a time in where we look within our, our own heart and we make assessment. And, and, and I pray that we would do that here this morning. Now, listen, we should examine our hearts. Um, if, if the Lord has touched us in any way concerning any known sin, forgiveness is not hard to find with him. Um, but then we should be able to partake of this in, in deep gratitude, should we not, knowing that there is a real possibility of forgiveness. Now, next week's story, I, I saved the most potent punch for next week. I think already you should, beginning, you should be beginning to feel in your heart a burden to go out and win lost people already. Because you already know what's coming even before we have spent any time seriously considering if there were extreme differences between Lazarus and the rich man in life, we're going to find out next week that the differences they experience in eternity are more extreme and more different and more calling upon us if we have any shred of decency, any ounce of compassion to want to do everything we can to not be even as that rich man, but to go out now, here, wherever we can, to do what we can to try and reach others with the truth. Well, listen, we're getting late. I know some people need to leave, so I'm going to call my uh, helpers up right now, and we're going to go ahead and partake of the communion.